So just as a reminder, every time we go through books, when we finish a book, like we finish 2 Corinthians, we're going back to Psalms, and we're just working through three Psalms at a time, and then we'll uh, study another book of the Bible. I'm still undecided as to whether to go to Genesis after this or to go to one of the Gospels. And if, if it's one of the Gospels, it's probably the Gospel of Luke that I'm more curious to go through. But Psalm chapter 7, all the Psalms are great. All the Psalms are great. Psalm chapter 7. Notice in verse number 1, it says, O Lord my God, in Thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. So the title of the sermon this morning is Them That Persecute Me. Them That Persecute Me. Just there you can see that in Psalm, uh, sorry, in, in verse number 1. Them That Persecute Me. This psalm is an analysis of persecution, okay? Um, if we ever s go through persecution in our life, whether it's, it's uh, you know, heavy persecution, you know, to the point of death for, for the name of Christ, or whether it's just some mild persecution, I believe there are some really key learnings that we can get out of this psalm, okay? So, of course, we know this life of King David constantly being persecuted. Not all that different to the Apostle Paul. When we read about the Apostle Paul in the, in the New Testament, we see that he's constantly being persecuted by those that hate the Lord. And so uh, Psalm chapter 7 picks up the same concept of, uh, uh, of David being persecuted. Now before we get too deep into this psalm, I just want to see, do, do you all have this introduction in your, in your, in your Bible where it says, <clears throat> uh, Shigeon of David, which is sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush, the Benjamin, Benjaminite. Do you all have that as an introduction? All right. I, I was just curious when I looked this up, I looked at what does that word Shigeon mean? Does anyone have any idea? Anyone want to try to explain what that is? All right. I'm, I'm not surprised that nobody knows. It's not an English word. It's not, tra this, this is actually a, a Hebrew word that's been transliterated into English. It's not been translated into English. So if you look up that word in your dictionary, you're not going to find any definition for it. Okay, it's not an English word at all. Now, <clears throat> when I look this up, there's, there's uh, not a lot of um, sort of agreement as to what this means. It's hard to know. Obviously, the, the um, Hebrew language was lost, was lost for many hundreds of years. And even the Hebrew that's spoken today in the nation of Israel does not line up perfectly with the Hebrew of the Bible. The way they pronounce things, their definitions for certain words, may not be the way it was in the Old Testament because the old Hebrew language was lost. And so this is one of the words that was, I suppose, lost. But I think we get an idea of what it means because this is a song of David. This is a song of David. Now, interestingly, if you guys are interested, go to um, Habakkuk. Turn to Habakkuk. Keep your finger there in the book of Psalms. Now, this, this, this isn't really about the sermon, but it's just, just a point of interest. If you go to Habakkuk, it's one of the minor prophets near the end of the Old Testament. You might want to start with Matthew and then work your way backwards if you're not sure where that is. But Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3 is actually a song as well. Okay, Habakkuk chapter 3 is a song as well. And um, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 1 says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigeonoth. Shigeonoth. Now, that word Shigeonoth is also not an English word. It's also a translated Hebrew word, which is the plural form of what we saw in there in Psalm 7, the Shigeon of David. So, my understanding is putting these two things together, and by the way, look at, look at verse 19, if you're in Habakkuk chapter 3, look at verse 19, just the last verse of that chapter. It says, The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hind's feet, he will make me walk upon my hind places to the chief singer on my, on my stringed instruments. So we see chapter 3 of Habakkuk is a song as well. It was written to be handed to, the, um, to the, uh, those that play stringed instruments. So it's, it's assumed here that Habakkuk was a Levite who was associated with temple uh, service, temple worship. That he would write songs so that those that would play instruments and sing songs would sing this. So it seems like Habakkuk is taking uh, what David wrote in Psalm 7 and writes in a piece of music that's similar, okay? So it sounds like to me that it's a style of music. 
It's a style of music of persecution and calling upon God for help. And Haggai takes that same idea or that same style or that same genre of music and applies that to his third chapter in the Bible. Okay? So I thought that was interesting just for you guys to be aware of. If you look up that word, you're not going to find it in the Bible. But it's, it's about a style of music being persecuted and the Lord coming through and delivering them through that persecution. Now, go back to Psalm 7. Psalm 7, another interesting fact of that introduction. It says that this song was sung concerning the words of Cush the Benjaminite. Okay? Now, you want, now that name Cush, you may be aware of it. Okay? It, that Cush was the grandson of Noah. When Noah got off the, off the ark, um, he, um, he had his son Ham, and Ham was the father of Cush. Another, another uh, Cush was also known for being the father of Nimrod. Some of you guys might be familiar with Nimrod and his historical um, importance in the Bible. Um, well, that's not the Cush that's been spoken of here. Okay, because that's Cush that came off shortly after the Ark of Noah. Now, this Cush that um, David is singing about, considering the words of Cush, is obviously, this was many hundreds of years later, this was a Cush that was persecuting David. Okay? Now, it's interesting that it says the Benjaminites. So it's obviously after the nation of Israel was created. And if you, again, keep your finger there in Psalm 7. Please turn to 1 Samuel. Please turn to 1 Samuel, because I want to really give you an introduction as to why this psalm was sung. Please turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 24. 1 Samuel, chapter 24. And many times... The songs that are sung uh, by David in the Psalms relate to some biblical story, okay? So we're going to read about this biblical story here in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. Let's pick it up here, 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. The Bible reads, you guys, this is a pretty popular story of, 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 us, of uh, King David and Saul. So if you remember, King Saul was persecuting King David at a point in his life. He was trying to kill King David, right? Because he, he was... He was uh, he was um, envious of what King David had, had achieved. He did not want King David to take the throne. He believed that kingship should follow his line. But God had already ordained King David to take over Israel once Saul had passed away. So we pick up the story when King David was persecuting, uh, sorry, that Saul was persecuting David. And it says here in verse number one, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So King David seeking, uh, sorry, King Saul seeking David goes into this cave, the Bible says, to cover his feet. Now, <clears throat> there's a bit of debate as to what that means, to cover his feet. What I believe happened here is that King, uh, King Saul basically went to relieve himself, okay? Went to the toilet, if you want, uh, into the cave and took off his pants. And obviously, when you take off your pants, it covered his feet. I believe that's, that's what's being uh, used here, is that he went to the toilet but King David and his men were hiding in that same cave, okay? And, and uh, Saul did not know about that. So verse number four, And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. So kings, David's men are saying, hey, this is what God said is going to deliver the enemy into your hands. You know, this is your chance to kill, to kill Saul. But instead, David cuts off a, a piece of garment off his skirt, off, off his robe. Okay, verse number five. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So we see David, you know, he's feeling guilty for doing that. You know, he could have killed, you know, King Saul. But he, instead, he just cut off a bit of fabric, and he feels guilty about that, okay? And he said unto his men, in verse 6, 
The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord and King! And, the, and when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So we see even though David was being persecuted, he had respect for the king of Israel. Okay? And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Now just pause there for a moment. Notice what David says to Paul. He says, Wherefore hearest thou men's words? King Saul, why are you hearing the words of these men? What are these men saying to, to, to King Saul? Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. So we see here that King Saul was hearing the words of men, was hearing rumors, was hearing false reports that David was trying to hurt him, that David was trying to kill him, that David want, wanted to destroy King Saul. And it was not true. Okay? And this is where we pick up in Psalm 7, verse number 1, King David uh, singing, of these, uh, uh, singing this psalm concerning the words of Cush, the Benjaminite. Okay? So Cush here is being referred to as one of these men bringing false rumors and false reports about David, saying that David's a wicked man, saying that David wants to hurt you, King Saul. Okay? And, and Cush the Benjaminite, which I think is relevant, because if you don't know, King Saul was a Benjaminite, okay? And he had the loyalty of many of his own tribe, of his own family and tribe, the Benjaminites, okay? So I hope this gives you an idea as we enter into Psalm 7, what this is about. Let's keep reading. Verse number 10 in 1 Samuel uh, 24, verse 10. Behold this day, thine eyes have seen how the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, kill thee. But mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and killed thee not. Know thou, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. So King David proves with this fabric, look, these reports about me, these rumors about me, they're not true. Look here, I could have killed you, but instead I cut off a piece of your, your robe, okay? Verse 12, and all this is relevant. Keep in mind what is being said here when we get to Psalm 7. King David says, The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. So turn back to Psalm 7. Back to Psalm 7. We see the heart of David, the ability to kill his enemy, to kill the man that is trying to kill him. And he says, look, I'm not going to do wickedness against you just because you're being wicked against me. And we also see that King David, or David, calls upon God to be the judge between he and Saul. Okay? He seeks the Lord to do justice. He seeks the Lord to revenge uh, his, his name being dragged through the mud. So, back to verse uh, Psalm 7. Now that you've got that, that uh, understanding of this psalm, it's going to make a lot more sense as we read through, and we'll see a lot of um, uh, similarities between this psalm and what we read there in 1 Samuel 24. So let's look at verse number 1 again. It says, O Lord my God, indeed do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Okay, this is the, this is the, the prayer, the song of David, during this time, being persecuted by uh, King Saul. And I'm, I've got five steps. This is about persecution. I've got five steps for you this morning. 
how to handle persecution. If you're going through persecution, these are five steps that will help you get through it, okay? Now, the first thing that we realize here with King David, step number one, is that he recognizes that only God can help him through the persecution, okay? He recognizes that only God can help him. Look at verse number two. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, talking about those persecuting him, rendering it in pieces while there is none to deliver. You know, David recognizes, look, there's no one else to deliver me. There's no one that can help me from the lion or from Saul here uh, destroying me, you know. There's no one else uh, but you, Lord. You're the only one that can step in and deliver me from this persecution. That's step number one. Recognize that only God can help you with your persecution. Okay, if you're being persecuted, the first person you ought to be turning to is not the police, okay, is not the local church, it's not your own strength, it's not your own army, if you've got that. David had his own army, he had his own men. Instead, he seeks the Lord first. He prays to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm in persecution. Please deliver me from this persecution. Now, there are other people that can help you in persecution. I'm not saying never turn to the church or turn to uh, people in, in leadership that are, you know, Christian leaders or your family or... No, but first, go to the Lord, okay? Go to Him first because He will be the one that can use these other people, these other institutions to help you through the persecution, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, so obviously, we see here David praying for physical salvation, being physically delivered from his enemies, those that are seeking to destroy him. That's step number one. Recognize that only God can help you through persecution. Now, step number two. This is probably the hardest part of going through persecution. Step number two is to do a self-analysis. Why am I going through persecution? Could it be me? Could it be my own fault? Could I be the one that has done wrong? Could it be I that have done wickedness and brought persecution upon myself? That's probably the hardest part. Because as Christians, when we go through persecution, you know, we might be filled with pride and say, well, see, I've stood up for the Lord and now the devil is sending his forces against me. And it's hard to turn around and say, hey, maybe it's me. Maybe it's my wickedness. Maybe it's my iniquity. Let's look at this psalm. Look, look what uh, King David says in verse number 3. He says, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, do you see the first thing he does? Instead of blaming the persecution, the first thing he does is he self analyzes Is it me, Lord? Is it my fault? Have I brought this upon myself? Because the Lord may very well allow persecution to come into your life as chastisement upon you, upon your disobedience. And if you say, no, there's no chance of that, well, then you've forgotten Psalm 6. Let's look back at Psalm 6 when we went through it. Let's very quickly look at Psalm 6. Again, another Psalm of David, verse number 1. It says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. So here in verse number one, we see David being chastised by the Lord. He recognizes that he had done wrong and the Lord was correcting him, right? And then look, drop down to verse number nine. The Lord have heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed, ashamed suddenly. So we see King David in, in, in Psalm 6 recognizes that his enemies had, had, um, had lifted themselves against him because he had done wrong, because he was being chastised by the Lord, okay? And once he got right with the Lord, once he confessed his sins before the Lord, once he, he, he copped the punishment and learned his lesson, then he knew that his enemies would go away, you know, uh, because the lesson had been learned, okay? And again, because we've got Psalm 6, we can now look at Psalm 7 and recognize David's learned this lesson, when he's being persecuted by his enemies, it could be his own fault. It could be his own doing. It could be his own foolishness. And we need to recognize this, guys. If we're being persecuted, was it you? <laughs> you know, is the Lord allowing this persecution because of your mistakes? 
is this the hand of chastisement upon the Lord and not actually coming from the devil himself, okay? Look at um, uh, verse number four. Sorry, did I finish verse three? Yeah, I did. Verse number four. So he's still analysis, 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 uh, he's still doing a self-analysis, okay, in verse number four. He says, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered them without cause, sorry, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. So this is a reference here of, of Saul, of King Saul. He says, I, if I have rewarded evil, have I done evil to King Saul unto him that was was at peace with me because if you know the history of King Saul and David, they were once friends, right? David went, stood up against Goliath, delivered Israel out of the Philistines. You know, King David would be called upon Saul to play his harp and help um, Saul, you know, with, with his anguish and his, his stress. They were once friends. You know, even, even uh, Saul's uh, son, Jonathan, became best friends with David. Okay, And so David says, hey, have I rewarded the one that I used to be in peace with, with evil? Have I done wrong to him? And then he says in brackets there, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. There's no reason for Saul to be mine enemy. There's no cause for it. And I have delivered him. Remember, I could have killed him in the cave. I, I could have I struck him dead. But I have delivered that, that one. You know, So Saul's just thinking about it. Have I done wrong to him? It's not, I've delivered him. You know, I could have killed him. I could have done wrong. I could have done wickedness. But, you know, he, he's looking at his own life. Have I, am I the one that's done wrong? And you don't need to turn there. I'll just read to you from 1 Thessalonians 5.15. We know this very well. The Bible says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, to all men. All men, Okay. Whether they're saved believers or whether they're unsaved, whether they're your enemies, the Bible says don't render evil for evil. If someone has done wrong to you, if someone has done evil to you, don't return that wickedness. Don't do evil back to them. Hey, do good unto them. That's what the Lord requires of us. All right? If you want to cut off a bit of their skirt, you know, if you get the chance just to prove, hey, I'm not your enemy. I'm not trying to hurt you. Then maybe do that. But if you're like David, it's going to cause you guilt anyway, okay? Because, uh, you know, David had a, had a good heart, you know? I'll also read to you from Romans 12, 17. Romans 12, 17. It says, recompense, recompense to no man evil for evil. Hey, this is a clear teaching in the Bible. Repeat it over and over. If someone's done evil to you, don't avenge yourself. If you're being persecuted, don't avenge yourself. Don't do evil, Okay? But, uh, sorry, uh, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I've read this a few times. And I think it's important, okay? If you feel the need to take revenge, no, do good. Allow God to take revenge on your behalf, okay? He will repay. He will do it. He promises that to us. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Come on, how many times have you done this? Someone that's your enemy and, and they have necessities. Have you gone and fulfilled that need for them? I, I can't think of a chance that I've done that. This is, this is a hard saying, right? You know, it's easy to give drink to someone that you love, that's your friend, that's your, your dad, that's your father, but to do it to your enemy, someone that wants to hurt you, that's a big ask, right? We read these things and we think it's easy, it's not really. <laughs> you know, feed him, if you thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay? Leave it in God's hands. Okay? Do good to your enemies, do good to those that persecute you. Now, Psalm 7, verse 5. Psalm 7, verse 5. So, sorry, back in verse 4, just before I read that, David's ready. He says, look, if I've done evil, all right, I deserve this persecution. 
You know, he, he's ready to cop his punishment. Verse number five. Let the enemy persecute my soul. This is if he's at fault. Okay, if, he, if he's at fault, he says, look, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust, seller. Okay, so if David had done anything wrong, he was ready and willing to receive the chastisement of the Lord, even if that meant allowing his enemies to take advantage of him, to hurt him. Okay, he doesn't go around blaming others. If it's his own fault, he doesn't blame the, the, the persecution. He doesn't blame God. He says, look, if I have done wrong, all right, I deserve this punishment. Okay, um, he, it, he, even if it's his own honor, his own name being dragged through the mud. If it hurts his reputation, so be it. I'll take the medicine for what I've done wrong. Okay? And the reason he can be this way, you say, well, that'd be hard if I have the enemy hurting me. Yeah, but if you recognize that it's God's chastisement and you know God is a heavenly father and that he loves you and he wants the best from you and he wants you to grow and mature, then this judgment is righteous. Okay, if the enemy persecutes it because the Lord allows it, it's righteous judgment coming from God. That's why David was able to accept it. Okay, because if it's me, then it's righteous that I'm being persecuted like this. It's coming from the Lord, so be it. Okay, if it hurts my honor, if it hurts my name, so be it. This is just punishment for the wrong that I may have done to my enemy. Okay, so step number one was a self-analysis, are you at fault? Have you done wrong? Is God chastising you? Now, we know the story here. It wasn't David's fault. In fact, David's been very kind, very good towards Saul, okay? So step three, step three. What did we see when, when, when David uh, uh, showed Saul the garment? He allowed God to be the judge. He allowed God to be the judge between him and his enemy didn't he? He wasn't the one seeking justice. He wasn't the one saying, hey, this is what you need to do, Saul, to make things right. He says, no, I'm going to allow God to be the judge between you and me. God knows who's done wrong. God knows who's done right. Regardless of what Kash the Benjamite has said about me, God knows the truth, okay? And uh, this reminds me again of, of what we've been reading in 2 Corinthians with Paul right? Paul was like, you know what? People have been saying wrong things about me, but I'm going to allow God to be the judge. God knows, and I'm going to let him be the avenger of, of, of uh, my, my name being dragged through the mud, if you remember that in 2 Corinthians. So, you know, maybe the Lord wants us to learn. Maybe the Lord has someone here that wants to learn this lesson. Maybe it's me, right? Not to take revenge upon ourselves, but allow God to be that judge. Look at verse number six. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. God, I want your judgment, not mine. I want your justice, not mine own. Okay? And he says, look, lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies. You know, now David knows, hey, it's not me. It's mine enemies that it's at fault. It's my enemies that are persecuting me without cause. I've not done anything wrong to them. And he's calling upon God to revenge him. Okay? And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with asking God to, uh, to uh, bring vengeance upon wrongdoing upon you. Nothing wrong with that. We know the justice and judgment of God is right. We know it's correct. Okay? But we're asking the Lord to do it on our behalf. Because our judgment might be wrong. We might be tainted with, um, you know certain, uh, I don't know, maybe, you know, grief and bitterness, and it might affect our judgment. You know, so, so David calls upon God to do it, you know. And um, against these, these false ac accusations, these false attacks, and um, it, it kind of reminds me of Matt's sermon on Friday, right? When, when Matt preached that the Lord holds the, the prayers of, of the saints, you know, as incense. And then when he's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth, he, he looks at those prayers again. You know, he, he takes in that incense once again, and that fuels the, the vengeance. It fuels his anger. You know, it's the same kind of idea. He's calling upon the Lord to be the one that steps in, to get angry because of the rage of the enemies, right? Verse number seven. And look at this. 
so shall the congregation of the people come past thee about. For their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. So David says, look, God, if you uh, judge, if you set things right against mine enemies, then the congregation of the people, this is, you know, in general, back then, Israel as a nation would come about thee. You know, the, the people would, would be looking at you. They see the judgment of God. They're going to draw closer to God. Okay? And it says, for their sakes, therefore return thou on high. You know, so the Lord's name would be proclaimed. They would uh, be drawn closer to God. When, when God brings judgment, it's going to cause his people to draw closer to him. Okay? And of course, you know, this is about Israel. But we can apply this to the local congregation. We can apply uh, this congregation to the local church, to the local New Testament church. You know, when the Lord answers our prayers, when the Lord delivers us from our enemies, you know, when the Lord, you know, helps us through sicknesses and difficulties in our life, it causes the children of God, the congregation, to rejoice, to praise God. And we ought to do that, right? We ought to do that when we see the Lord's hand when we see him answer prayers for us, we ought to praise him and draw closer to him. It brings a real reality that our God is real, that our God is living, that our God loves us, and that our God hears our prayers when we call upon him. So God's judgment is, is, is something that's going to cause us to draw closer to him. Verse number 8. The Lord shall judge the people. Just my enemies? No, he says, look, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. <clears throat> Are you ready to say that? You know, it's easy to say, God, judge my enemies. You know, judge them. Are you ready to say, God, judge me also? You know, are you ready to say, God, judge me according to my righteousness? <laughs> According to my integrity that is in me, we all know we're sinners. We all know we do wrong. You know, are you ready to say that to God <laughs> in the moment that you're being persecuted? Uh, but of course, hey, we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you've, you've believed in his death, burial, and resurrection, you've called upon the name of the Lord, and you're saved today, then the righteousness of Christ has been imputed upon you. Hey, I can, I can approach the, the, the throne of God boldly and say, yes, Lord, please judge me on this righteousness and please make that the righteousness of Jesus Christ, okay? Because uh, that's, I, I'm in Christ, okay? And so I'm one of your children. I'm one of your children. And yes, the Lord will protect his own children, okay? I mean, as parents, think about when people, you know, say nasty things about you or do wrong to you. You know, it's annoying, but you can probably just get over it pretty quickly. But what about when they're doing it to your children? You know, when your children are being bullied, your children are being, you know, uh, uh, teased or, or um, whatever, you know, uh, have been attacked or whatever. It hurts a lot more, okay? And um, we're the children of God. You know, God will avenge us if people have done wrong to us. Don't worry about it. He's going to do it. He promises that. He's going to do it. We don't need to step in and take matters into our own hands. Okay? So David asked, look, God, I mean, you know, once, once he's done the self-analysis, my enemies are wrong. Please judge them for their, for, their, for their wickedness. And please judge me for my righteousness. I've done right. I've done good. You know, we see David's got a clean heart here. He realizes I've not done anything wrong to these people. He says, judge me according to that, Lord. Please reward me for the good that I've done. Okay, please punish them for the wrong and please reward me for the good that I have done. Verse number nine. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Okay, so just reinforce in here that the purpose for God to judge the wicked, it says that their wickedness will come to an end. That's number one. And also for God to judge and for God's people to be strengthened, to establish the just, to strengthen the just, when we see the hand of God fall upon the wickedness of this world. Okay? Now it says here, 
the Lord trieth the, the hearts and reins. Now, I'm going to ask just any, anybody, feel free, even the ladies. Does anybody know what that word means, reins? R-E-I-N-S. Just give me your best guess, yeah? Horse reins, yeah. I mean, it's not the answer, okay? But when I used to read this, that's exactly what I used to think, right? Because it happens quite a few times where it talks about judging the heart and the reins. Of, and um, I used to think, you know, okay, God, please judge my heart and also the reins. So, yeah, like you're riding a horse and you're holding on to the, the straps, I guess, that's the reins. And you can direct the horse which way it wants to go. Um, and I used to think that's what it meant, that God, you know, please judge my heart and also take my heart by its reins and, and sort of see how it is. That's what I used to think. Now, uh, I'll get you to hold your finger there. Just go back one book to the book of Job. Go back to the book of Job, chapter 16. And we'll look at um, the first mention of this word, reigns in the Bible. The first mention, Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16, verse 11. Job chapter 16, verse 11. Give me one more moment there. Job chapter 16, verse 11. These are the words of Job. Look what he says here in verse 11. God hath delivered me to the ungodly. By the way, do you see there that God sometimes allows someone to be delivered to the enemies, to the wicked, to the ungodly? God has his own purposes for whatever reason. Job went through this as well. And then he says, and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He have also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. So we know, of course, that Job went through a lot of suffering, a lot of problems, you know, when he was being uh, persecuted by Satan, but being allowed by God for that to happen to him. Okay. Now, he's using, uh, I guess, uh, uh, poetic or illustrative language. You know, obviously, God did not break or shake him to pieces, but like his neck or anything like that. But look at verse 13. It says, His archers come past me round about and cleaveth my reins asunder. What's that? And doth not spare. He poureth out my gold upon the ground. That word gold comes from the gold bladder. Okay? Now, what the reins are, it's an old English word for your guts, for your intestines for your liver, for your goal, like pretty much your guts, okay? Now, because um, look at verse 13 again. It says, His archers come past me round about and cleaveth. That word cleaveth or cleaves has two meanings. And it's funny about this word in English. The two meanings are the complete opposite, okay? To cleave is, all, is to join together. That's one way, you know, uh, for a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, you know? But cleave also means to separate to tear apart, the total opposite, okay? And so when it says here, he cleaveth, or he tears apart, my reins asunder, you know, because these archers, I think, have pretty much uh, hurt him. Uh, this is figurative language. This didn't really happen to him, okay? But he says, look, my, it's a bit gory language, I guess, but look, my, my guts have, have gone everywhere, is what he's saying. And doth not stare, he poureth out my goal upon the ground. Okay, so yeah, it's gory language here. But I just want to show you that that word reigns actually means your guts. Okay, now back to Psalm 7. Psalm 7. So when he says in verse 9, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins, he's saying, you know, God, please test or try my heart and my guts. <laughs> okay, now we still use that language today. Okay, when, you know, we might say, we use similar terminology. We, we might say, boy, that person has guts. Now, that person has guts. Now, everyone's got guts, okay? But when we're saying they've got guts, what are we saying? They're very courageous. They've got a lot of inner strength, you know? They've got guts. Or you might say, you know, I'll, I'll go with my gut. When you're saying that, I'll go with my gut, what are you saying? You know, my gut feeling is telling me this, I'll go with that. You know, you haven't really got any facts to go with it, but it's just your innermost being is telling you something, and I'm going to go with that, okay? Your instincts, if you will, Okay? Or you might say, boy, that was a kick in the guts. What are you saying? You know, someone's, someone's hurt you, someone's done something. It doesn't really stab you in the guts. But, you know, it, it hurts so much. It hurts so much in my inner being. It was like a kick in the guts. 
You know, we still use that kind of terminology today. And that's what basically uh, David is talking about here in, in Psalm 7. He's saying, look, God, try my heart and try my guts, <laughs> all right? My, my innermost being, like know me deep down, okay? Because I think he realizes that when he looks at himself, he's not going to be able to judge his own heart and his innermost, you know, correctly. He asks God to do it. He asks God to step in and, uh, and um, you know, let the wickedness come to an end of the wicked, but also try me. See if there's wickedness in me. Please check my heart out. Check, check my innermost being, okay? Because when pride hits, when we're filled with pride, it's hard to blame ourselves, okay? We might, there might be issues within us. There might be problems within us. And we can deceive ourselves. That's what pride is. We deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves. And we can't see the problems within our own selves. We see it with everyone else. But David's willing, look, God, I might be filled with pride. I might not be able to judge myself properly. I need you to step here in here. Try my heart. Am I genuine, Lord? You know, am I serving you, Lord? You know, am I doing right? And he asks God, please look deep into me. Look into my deepest emotions, my deepest thoughts, and my deepest motives. Am I doing this to serve the Lord? Or am I doing it to serve man? You know, verse number 10, Psalm 7, verse 10. My defense is of God, which saith the upright in heart. So, you know, if God is your defense, you don't need to worry. In a sense, God is my defense. Now, I'll just use a sports analogy. You know, when you play sports, you basically have two ways of playing. You've got defense and you've got offense, right? Offense, normally you're trying to score goals or something, points. And defense, you're trying to prevent those points or goals being scored upon you. Now, I'll, I'll just use the analogy of soccer, okay? If I had God as my goalkeeper, if I had God as my defense, do you think I'd be worried about the enemy scoring goals? If God was my defense? No. What would I be concerned with? If I knew God was defending me, I'd be concerned with the offense, right? I wouldn't be worried about, hey, God, have you got it under control? No. I'd be like, God's got it, you know? So I'm going to worry about the offense. I'm going to move forward, all right? And so the same principle is here, guys. You know, if you're being persecuted and you know God's going to step in and defend you, then you don't need to worry about defending yourself. You don't need to go into defense. God's got it covered. Let him take care of it. He's a better goalkeeper than you are, okay? Let him take care of it. If you're worried about it, it's going to prevent you from going forward. It's going to stop you from being positive. You know, it's going to stop you from serving the Lord if you're so worried about defense. God's got it covered. You go and score points. You go and serve the Lord. You go and, and, and earn rewards in heaven. You know, if you've done right, if you've done right, then God's got it covered. Don't worry about it, okay? Don't waste time defending yourself. Uh, spend your time doing greater things for God. Look at verse 11. God judgeth the righteous and is angry with the wicked every day. Every day God is angry with the wicked. Now, most preachers don't want to talk about this. They don't want to talk about God being angry, okay? Because, oh, you know, we only want to talk about God being love. And God is love. God is merciful. God is long-suffering and God is love. Ah, amen. But He's also an angry God. He's also a God that's angry with the wicked every day. Every day. Guys, ever since Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, every day for the next 6,000 years, God has been angry with the wicked. Okay, Angry with the sinners. And of course, He has great love which is why he sent Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross for us, okay? We don't ignore that as well. But, uh, you know, God is judging mankind on a daily basis, okay? Now, <clears throat> I just thank God I've got Christ imputed righteousness upon me because I know I do wicked things, all right? I, I know I do wrong. I know I, just, I, I still sin in this life, okay? We're trying to overcome that. We're trying to turn from those wicked things and live holy, you know, we all should be on that journey trying to do that. But if God were to really judge you for your wickedness every day, boy. <laughs> you know, thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank, thank God that He came in and paid the penalty for my sins. 
But notice that God does not get used to wickedness. He does not get used to sin. It's not like 6,000 years later, God's like, you know what? Ah, everyone's wicked. I'm just going to, all right, I'll just deal with it now. No, he's still angry every day, okay? And if God is still angry at wickedness, if, if sin still bothers God, then we ought not to get used to it, guys. We ought not to get used to wickedness, all right? You might have a pet sin that you're struggling with, and, and you might be doing that sin every day or every week or whatever, something that you're constantly struggling with. You're going to get to a point where you're like, well, that's just me. No, God is angry, with the wicked every day. You ought to be angry with your sin every day as well. If you're a child of God, if you're trying to be more godly, if you're trying to be more like Jesus Christ, hey, don't get comfortable with your sins. Don't get comfortable with the wickedness of this world. Okay? Oh, you know, the world's not going to change, so I'll send my kids to whatever, and it's full of wickedness. It's full of blasphemy in the name of God. No. Don't get used to it. God's not getting used to it. God still hates sin. You ought to be the same way. You ought to reflect God, okay? It's easy to get used to wickedness. It's easy to get used to sin, but that's not how it ought to be. Verse number 12. Verse number 12. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He have bent his bow and made it ready. I'll try to speed up a little bit now. But uh, verse number 12, the, the, the first he is the persecutor the wicked person, okay, that we saw in verse number 11. You know, God is angry at the wicked every day. The first he here in 12 is talking about the wicked person. So it says, if he, the wicked person, turn not. All right? So what that means is, if they continue on this path of wickedness, if they continue on this path of persecuting God's people, you know, the, the innocents, then it says he, speaking of God, God will wet his sword. What does that mean? It means God will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow. God's going to get his, his bow ready. His bow ready. And made it ready. Okay? Verse 13. He also, sorry, he hath also prepared for him the instruments of death and ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. So God gets his arrows for his bow, points them to the persecutors. He starts sharpening his sword. But notice in verse 12 it says, if he turn not. Because we have indeed a long-suffering God, a merciful God. Okay? Even the wicked get a chance to make things right. Okay? God doesn't come straight down and destroy them. He gives them a chance to turn. He gives them a chance to say sorry and apologize and make things right. Okay? Before he comes down with judgment. But we see, while they're doing wrong, while they're doing wickedness, while they're persecuting uh, God's people, while King Saul is persecuting David, God is just patiently sharpening his sword, getting his bow ready, got his arrows pointed ready, just in case you don't turn, I'm ready to go. Okay? But you see, God's not in a rush. He's got perfect timing. You know, God will unleash his anger and his wrath in due time. In due time. Okay? God is long-suffering. And uh, we don't like that. <laughs> we, don't want, we, don't, we like God being long-suffering with us, but we don't like God being long-suffering with our enemies. <laughs> okay? But just know, know that he's preparing uh, the weapons to attack the enemy. Okay? Now this brings us to step number four. Step number four. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord to unleash his judgment at the right time. Okay? God hasn't ignored your cries for help. God has not ignored the persecution that's come your way. He's just getting ready. Getting ready and giving them time, okay? And if he gives them more time and they're still wicked and they're still persecuting you, they're just storing up the wrath of God even more. It's going to come down even stronger, okay? So don't worry about it. Just wait. Wait for the Lord's timing to come and protect you, to deliver you from the hands of your enemies. Look at verse 14. Speaking of the wicked here, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. He hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. Okay, so he compares here to a pregnant late, late woman going through labor that the persecutor goes through kind of labor pains of his own, but of his own doing. Okay, it's his own iniquity. It's his own sinfulness. He conceived mischief, right? He's, he's a problem. He's a, he's a problem child. He causes problems wherever he goes and brought forth 
falsehoods. He lies against the truth. These are things that God will bring justice and judgment upon. This is the kind of persecution that will come uh, from the Lord to, to deliver you, right? People that have done you wrong, people that have caused you problems, people that have lied about you, you know, God will, as we'll see, God will cause their own uh, uh, wickedness to fall upon them. Look at verse 15. He hath made a pit, speaking about the persecutor. So, so the one that's trying to hurt you, your enemy, the persecutor has made a pit. He's dug a hole in the ground, hoping that you would fall in it. Okay? Hoping that others, that God's people, will fall into his pit. He says, he made a pit and digged it. But look at this. And he's fallen into the ditch, which he hath made. God sometimes just allows the wicked to destroy themselves. Okay? And it's sort of this, this sense of justice when you see their devices for evil and they've been hurt by their own wickedness. Okay? You know, I won't go into it all now. It's going to take, okay. Look at, look at verse 16. His mischief shall return upon his own head. His own mischief. The own problems he was making are going to fall upon him. And his violence dealing shall come down upon his own pate. Now again, anybody, what does that word pate mean? Pate, P-A-T-E. Head, yeah. It's actually defined there in the own verse, right? Um, his mischief shall return upon his own head, and just it repeats it again, shall come upon his own pate. The, what pate actually means is your scalp. It's the top of your head, okay? Um, look at verse 17. So we, now we've waited on the Lord. The Lord has brought judgment upon the wicked. In this case, he has caused um, the wicked to fall by their own sword, by their own wickedness. Okay? That's how God uh, brought judgment upon them. But verse 17, and uh, this is so important. Once God has taken revenge on your enemies, once God has delivered you out of the hands of your enemies, we are to praise God. We are to praise the Lord okay, in persecution. Look at verse 17. I will... I will, I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness. Okay, because once God has judged the wicked, we know it's been done in His righteousness. Okay, now you might say, God, I wanted it to be harder. I wanted you to hurt them more. Hey, don't worry. Praise God in His righteousness. Remember, His justice, His judgment, His punishment is just. Okay, it's righteous. Now, your judgment might not be righteous. Okay, so if God carries out punishment and you're not happy with it, hey, that's, let go of it. Let go of your bitterness and just praise God that through His righteousness, He's taken revenge for you. Praise God that He has listened to you. How does He praise Him? Look at verse 17. And will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. This was a memory verse. I wanted to preach about singing uh, praises in the face of persecution. We're going to look at that in verse uh, number 9. A little bit more but again guys this is going to get you through persecution okay this is what's going to get you through persecution not dwelling on your enemies not stressing about the persecution what's going to get you through it is remaining positive what's going to get you through it is praising the Lord okay thank you Lord for the persecution that's come my way and once he delivers you from it thank you Lord for delivering me out of it okay even in persecution is a time to rejoice and sing. Okay? Become acquainted with singing. Okay? I'm not saying singing, you know, top 10 MTV songs. You know, I'm saying get acquainted with singing praises of God. Get acquainted with the Psalms. They're full of songs. Get acquainted with our hymn book. Lots of praises and songs that you can sing unto the Lord. Okay? And when you're stressed and when you're worried and you're going through difficulties, praise God. Sing praises to God. It's going to help you get through those tough times. Okay? And uh, look, never get to a point, and I was, I was like this as a child, so I guess I'm speaking to the children here, where I was going to a traditional church, singing the old hymns, and I was going to a school that was singing all the fancy, you know, hill song music that were very shallow, okay? But they were fleshly. They appealed to my flesh. And I enjoyed that kind of music, 
even though the doctrine and the teaching of those songs was so shallow that anybody could sing those songs. They were like love songs to your girlfriend, okay? And when I got to church and I would sing these old hymns, though they were full of doctrine, though they were full of truth, though they were full of praise to God, I was like, this is boring. You know, I'd rather sing those other fleshly songs. No, look, never get to a point to where, you, where these old hymns become boring to you. Hey, they're full of praise, they're full of doctrine to God. Okay, get acquainted with these songs. You know, try not to be late to church. You know, never get to the point where you're like, well, you know, we know Kevin starts preaching about 20 minutes into the church service. We'll come in 20 minutes late and miss the song service. No. You know, it says here in verse 17, I will praise the Lord. This is something that we need to be doing. We need to be singers. We need to, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got a bad voice. It doesn't matter if you don't have a strong voice. Learn to sing praises to God. This is one sure way to, to praise the name of the Lord Most High, as we see here. Let me read to you quickly from Matthew 5.10. The Bible reads the words of Jesus. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you're blessed when you're persecuted. You're blessed by God for righteousness' sake. Okay, why? Because theirs, yours, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus says, hey, you're blessed. You're like, no, God, I'm being cursed. No, you're being blessed. All right? When you're being persecuted for righteousness, when you're being persecuted for the sake of Christ. And then it says in verse 12, rejoice, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? Why should I be glad when I'm being persecuted? For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This book is full of persecution. This book is full of persecution for God's people. And if you're being persecuted for the name of Christ, hey, you're being numbered against these prophets. You're being numbered against these great men of God. And you're earning rewards in heaven. That's something to be happy about. That's something to rejoice in. Eternity forever in heaven, great rewards, and, and, and you're worried about this temporary persecution in this world. You know, when we compare these two things, I think we realize we'd rather have those rewards in heaven because that's forever. It's eternal, eternal, right? It's eternity. So in conclusion, guys, in conclusion, the five steps of going through persecution. Number one, recognize that only God can help you through persecution. Number two, do a self-analysis. Is it chastisement from God? Have you done wicked? Are you wrong? Number three, allow God to be the judge between you and your enemy. Number four, wait on the Lord to unleash judgment. Okay? And number five, praise the Lord in persecution. Okay, let's pray.